Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 12 of the Hot Path Show. I'm Johnny from a new location, joined by Tobias. Welcome in, Tobias. How's it going? I is going pretty good. How about yourself? Doing well, doing well. Going through a little bit of a move right now, so uh, in the new office setup, but um, don't have it quite set up, so I'm still kind of going off the little laptop right now, but I'll give you just a, give you a quick little preview at what my office is looking like right now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. A little bit of a mess. I'm going to have a fun weekend ahead of me of getting everything all set up here. But other than that, things have been going great. I'm excited to be uh, here with you today for a very special episode of the Hot Path Show. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us a little quick preview of what you're going to be talking to us about today. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I was supposed to release my game <laughs> uh, on Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, just read the instructions. Oh, I, it, um, I should maybe have a the trailer up i don't know but i can just talk about it I, I got it right here actually or oh, i'll right. get it yeah right uh but um yeah so um just read instructions first person shooter co-op fully built in uh, dots uh tons of enemies tons of entities and it was supposed to be released on wednesday uh steam uh, or valve had the other plans for me so i'm stuck in uh, review I don't know, review hell. I don't know if that's the <laughs> word you can use, but some I'm stuck in being build reviewed and it's it's uh, like seven, eight days in now and it's supposed to take maximum of five. So I'm just very confused. But we're going to go through anything, anything anybody would like to know <laughs> how this game is built. Uh, I have all the whole thing on my laptop here in front of me and we can take a look at anything at all of how a uh, full game in DOTS is built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be a really cool thing again to just get some um, good insight into like what a real project looks like that was built out with Unity's dots and everything like that. Um, and like you mentioned before, you kind of have a list of a whole bunch of different topics that you think people might find interesting. Um, I know that you were going to kind of share a couple, and then we can also kind of have the audience go ahead and choose some of their, um, you know things that they might find interesting that they can uh, select from and we can kind of have you walk through how you did it. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. I just got to just point out one thing here that just just happened. Can you can you guess what's what email I'll, I just received? No way. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm, I'm trying to log into my to my Steam account here properly. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll let I'll let you do that. But let me just see. Uh, thanks for bringing. That would be awesome. Um, oh, so I got. Uh, I can just. I got a um, um, thanks uh, since I, I sent like another uh, support ticket to them. Right, 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 right. What's going on? And now I got the response. Thanks for bringing this to our attention. I see that your app was already reviewed, but the result were not sent to you properly. I've got that fixed now, and you should receive that shortly. Oh, okay. So well, maybe we, could, it, yeah, maybe you might could, be launching by the end of this show. <laughs> it declined also. It could be like I have some issue and I need to fix it before they accept my release. Who knows? Well, well it's not yeah, updated we'll in my in my in my dashboard yet. But uh, yeah, so yeah, like, this is like being a news reporter almost. <laughs> <laughs> breaking news! Breaking news! Coming live from the from, from the Steam dashboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I really hope that you get it um, out today because uh, you did mention to me that uh, you're going to be part of the Steam FPS Fest next week. Um, and so it would yeah. just, I think it would be perfect to have it, you know, ready to go. If people come across it and find it interesting that they could just buy it right then and there. Yeah, exactly. 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 But yeah, so that's, that's a um, good, good summary of the concept of how we should go through the different areas or whatever people want to hear. I'm, I'm up for any of the, I'm, and even if, if I didn't write it down, if there's something you just see like, oh, that shit looks cool. What, what's yeah, going yeah. on there? Can it, uh, just tell me there's nothing, nothing. There's secret sauce, obviously, in the <laughs> system, but but there's like nothing that I can explain or show like this over a stream that would like right, 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 uh, right. give away the secret. No, 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 you can see any part of the source code. That's no problem for me. Sweet, yeah, yeah. But yeah. yeah. Anyways, before we move on, I was just gonna say um, I think I had a little bit of a theory as to why it was taking so long to review. It's probably because the reviewer was just having so much fun playing your game <laughs> that they forgot to 
you know, actually go ahead and, and they, you know, and, and now, now they just like came up from the playing coma, uh, realizing, oh, I should watch the <laughs> like, hot should... path show. <laughs> I should watch the hot path show that's coming up right now. Oh, we got, <laughs> I need to get back with the review. <laughs> exactly. It was like exactly on like 10 o'clock that my, my email came. Yeah. Crazy. Right. When we started. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So yeah, before we um, kind of get into some things here, I'm just going to go ahead and go through a couple miscellaneous announcements. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out, actually, I mean, I guess I can kind of continue sharing my screen here. Um, so this weekend is the Ludum Dare 55 game jam. I just want to call this one out. Uh, Ludum Dare is one of my favorite game jams. I think it was like kind of one of the first actual proper game jams that I participated in. Um, so it always kind of holds a special place in my heart. And I always like um, you know, participating them in them when I can. Uh, this weekend is obviously a crazy busy weekend for me, so unfortunately I won't be able to do this one, but uh, you'll see that it starts in about five hours here. Um, they're going to go ahead and announce the theme here um, at, the, at the start time. Um, but yeah, so yeah, if, if anyone is going to be participating in the Ludum Dari Game Jam, feel free to go ahead and uh, maybe share your progress in the Discord. I always like to see in, uh, you know, what kinds of things people create in there. Uh, Tobias, have you ever done a Ludum Dare game jam? I know you recently did like the Global Game Jam and a couple other ones, but have you ever done a, a Ludum Dare event? I think one, but uh, for me, I think most of the game jams are sort of blurring together, so I don't remember which one of them was uh, Ludum Dare. I, I gotcha. think I've done like game jams in four different type of organizations, and one of them got to be Ludum Dare because it's yeah, so popular. Yeah, it's and, a yeah, and very popular one. It always gets you know, thousands of entries. And um, I know, I think the last one that they did, it was, I want to say it was like recently after uh, Unity kind of did their, announced their runtime fee and everything like that. So there was like a giant uptick in games made with Godot. So, um, you know, hopefully, you know, it'd be interesting to see like kind of what the breakdown is. Cause usually they do kind of like, you know, this, this many games made with Unreal, this many games made with Unity and everything. So um, yeah, it would be interesting to kind of see the, see the little breakdown on that. Yeah, uh, I'm having a little bit issue with my with my stream right now. Uh, I'll go join back again. You can continue. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just can... I just got some announcements to go through and everything here. Yeah, so. yeah. Go for it. Um, so yes, it is LD weekend. Uh, did twenty ish. Only a third ended up with the whole project. Gotcha. Um, okay, so let's see. I'll go ahead and move on to the next kind of announcement here. Um, wanted to bring up, they uh, Unity just r recently announced that um, their Unite event is happening this year in Barcelona, Spain, September 18th through the 20th. Um, so yeah, it's uh, Unite is always a very fun and exciting event. Um, just you know, a, a very specific and Unity focused event where they have a bunch of announcements, a bunch of talks, everything like that. Um, and, you know, of course, it's kind of a standard conference where they're showcasing all kinds of cool different things on the show floor. Um, so, yeah, the Unite is happening this year in Barcelona, September uh, 18th through the 20th. You can't purchase tickets or anything right now. This is just kind of like a, you know, save the date. So make sure you have it kind of blocked off on your calendar if you do want to um, go to Spain to... Um, yeah, be at Unite. I think uh, it'll be a fun time. Hopefully I'll be able to attend this year. Uh, last year was in Amsterdam and I was able to attend there. So Tobias, did you see this, that uh, Unite is happening in Barcelona this year, September 18th to 20th? Oh, no. Well, there, there you go. Announced today? Um, a couple days ago, they had uh, basically put out like a little save the date thing. So if they have a bunch of uh, dots related things, maybe I should try to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, could be something. I was a little bit. Uh, the last one was not a lot of dots thing, so I should. I thought it wasn't really. Yeah, the, right, not the yeah. perfect unite to go for me. Yeah, yeah. No, they hadn't really announced uh, anything about you know what the contents of this event are going to be, but yeah, basically just put out the the dates, and it is a couple days long, so 18th to the 20th. I think the last one, um, it was really just like primarily happening on on one day. There was like kind of a a welcome party the day before, but. It was all just like on one day. So this is a little bit longer, um, you know, give you some more times to kind of, you know, check out different things and uh, go to different talks and all that. 
Okay, um, next up, uh, real quickly, do just want to call out that uh, the Unity Asset Store has got kind of some sales going on right now. So there actually is one coming up starting April 17th. Um, and uh, you can get uh, this 50% off uh, 300 plus assets. And they're doing the uh, daily flash deals where there's like, you know, you get like 12 hours at like 70% off. And then I think maybe another 12 at 60% off or something like that. And then um, it'll be down to 50% for the re remainder of the sale. Um, so yeah, these things are not on sale right now, but they will be um, again starting April 17th. However, there is still the $20 asset sale going on right now. Um, so if you just go over to, I guess we go to the on sale ones here. Um, let's see if we can just click the $20 asset store sale. Um, you can see that, yeah, there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, different cool things available for $20. Um, so yeah, it's uh, definitely worth it to go ahead and check it out. I will go ahead and post this in the link right here. And uh, yeah, I'll definitely let you know um, on the as on the spring store sale if there's any cool dots related sales. Um, if there's any yeah dots assets on there. Um, and then yeah, so then with that, I do just want to remind you all that you can support us over on Patreon if you do want to. Um, you can get there at Patreon.com/TurboMakesGames. We do have a link down in the description if you want to just go there directly. And uh, I'm going to be putting up uh, bonus videos there every month for all Patreon supporters. Uh, the one that I did last month was just kind of like a GDC recap vlog where I just kind of talked about my whole experience uh, at GDC and showed some kind of pictures and videos of some cool things that I was doing along the way. Um, Let's see, also for uh, some of the higher tiers, I have some behind the scenes things. So I did um, a, a recent video where I did kind of like showcasing the hardware setup that I use for my computer, another one about my software setup. And then I think the one that I'm gonna be doing for this month is um, just kind of more about like my uh, cameras and recording setup. So if you're interested in that, um, again, you can go ahead and check those things out over on patreon.com slash turbo makes games. Okay, um, so now we can go ahead and get into some of our warm up topics here. So we're gonna go ahead and um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to uh, start off with a, a fun little warm up topic because, um, you know, like I mentioned, I'm moving into a new place this week. So I've been kind of like, you know, building a lot of furniture and doing things like this. So kind of wanted to just talk a little bit about um, building physical things because I know, you know, this show is primarily around like, you know, building it's like software related things. Um, but I just kind of want to like pick your brain a little bit and like ask you is like, um, you know, is, is building like physical things, something that you kind of like enjoy doing from time to time, whether it's like, you know, again, furniture, or maybe you're just kind of like building some things uh, as a hobby, or you kind of like a DIY type person, like, where do you kind of, where do you kind of fit on this? I would be like a uh, thousand percent more DIY. D D yeah. D D y I No, I can't. D yeah. DIY. Do it, do it, do it yourself. DIY. Yeah, yeah, do it yourself. That's that's right. I would be a lot more like that if I felt like I had the tools and whatever. Uh, I actually built a ton of stuff when I was younger before I discovered software. Um, I built my own. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> I, I built my own uh, dirt bike. Oh nice. Yeah, uh, like a shopper inspired dirt bike uh, uh, from scratch, basically just the engine and the wheels. What's the thing we had? And and that's then we sweet. built and and. And built and, and I love it. And I would have gone a lot with that and and do do more stuff. I built my own softbox, the lighting I have right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this, but, but it feels so limiting when you need all the hardware to act in your hands. Right. As soon as yeah. I made my first program, I'm like, there's endless possibilities. I don't have to go buy exactly. You just like, once you get your computer, it's like yeah, it. you have everything you need basically. So in a computerless world, I would be a engineer, one hundred percent <laughs> building like cars or whatever. Yeah. So nice. I'm, I'm, a, I like physical things, but uh, you know, it's trickier. How about yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm definitely like in a similar boat. I love building things. I know, like my dad kind of got me into, you know, just helping fix things around the house at like a very young age and all that. Um, and then as I started to get a little older, um, I actually built um, a little go kart like me and my friends did. Um, we like we got kind of like the frame off of somebody, but then we like swapped out the engine for a little bit more powerful engine um, and did that all. And then um, when I was old enough to get a car, um, you know, I had that and then they kind of had some like 
catastrophic um, failures in, in some of the engine components. So we had to basically, um, my dad and I just to kind of rebuild like the entire engine, um, you know, from scratch over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, and then, yeah, the, you know, of course, continued to have problems with that car. So I was very familiar with taking that apart and, and putting it all back oh, together. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I definitely have like a very mechanically inclined brain as well. Um, so yeah, I, I love building physical things and, um, so yeah, even though, you know, it's, uh, kind of annoying that I haven't really been able to do a whole lot of, um, like developments and stuff during these past couple of weeks, you know, it's still nice to kind of mix it up a little bit and been yeah, assembling this, uh, new desk that I'm at right now. And um, yeah, put the little monitor stand. I have my UPS battery backup. I installed like a little bracket thing, so it like is hanging from the bottom there, so it's all kind of tucked away and everything. Um, but yeah, no, definitely um, in a in a very similar boat to you. Yeah, yeah. If I had a like a like a nice e, uh, universal type big battery, like almost like car size battery, like for a tester or something, and a, and a powerful motor, and then just like a garage full of crap like building <laughs> shit i would build something that i can ride in for sure that would oh, yeah. be yeah, amazingly yeah. fun but is there anything that costs a shit ton of money oh yeah no for sure yeah <laughs> yeah um is there anything that you've built that was like like a particularly like memorable thing that was like you know really cool or fun or interesting <laughs> yes yes this was basically the first time we uh me and my friend we 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 uh my dad was an electrician when I was little and, and he gave me his old screwdrivers to pick apart and do whatever I wanted to with them. And so I had a bunch of these po quite powerful motors. So I got, we, we got them and then we built a Lego uh, thing um, with wheels on and then we put up the, the, the motor and you know, it's hard to make a Lego wheel drive through a, like a chain or something. That's re it's a really tricky mm. thing to build. So we just put a big, um, a fan on it and just made sure it was above the 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 car thing and then and we didn't have any radio controllers so we had like this you know the radio controlled car battery thing and okay we just yeah, yeah it up and we just like you know pushed in the last wire and then just let it go and just let it <laughs> just go a hundred percent straight into a wall and just <laughs> explode into pieces and it was the most awesome thing ever <laughs> We did that for like four four weeks straight, I think, with all those sorts of different uh, uh, contraptions and all sorts of different motors and, and fans and whatever. And it was just so. I, but I was I, I think I was like nine years old or something. That was just yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's super memorable. That's yeah, the prime time for it. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought up Lego. I was big into Legos when I was a kid. I was building all the Lego sets. So I was subscribed to like the Lego magazine. Um, yeah. and then, yeah, we even started getting into the Lego robotic stuff a little bit. Um, there was actually like a bunch of like Lego robotics, like competitions yeah. that were kind of happening locally. Oh, right. Competitions. Yeah. And oh. so, um, yeah, I actually, um, it's like my dad started like a little club at my elementary school, um, where we like kind of like build out these little like, um, uh, things for the, the competitions, like you basically get like this giant kit and then it would have all these like different like challenges that you'd have to complete. Like you'd build like robots to like complete the different challenges and everything. And um, yeah, then you'd go to competitions and um, everyone would kind of like bring in their robots and, and do it all. So yeah, it was fun times. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, I had Lego Minecraft. Uh, Mind, Mindstorm. Mindstorm. Oh, yeah. Minecraft. That was yeah, so yeah. Weird. Minecraft. Lego like Minecraft. Uh, That's the thing now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the Mindstorm, yeah, I had that. And I, I pro that was the first time I programmed something uh, in my computer. But it was, you know, for, for 13 years and you know, upwards. Uh, and I think I was 10 when I got it. So it was slightly too complicated for me to get into the really nitty gritty. Uh, you know, being 10 and starting to program, even in like Scratch or whatever, the recent. Re Lisa right yeah was the, that no, was like that kind of visual programming like i remember you had like the little it almost looked like little legos like the little things would kind of fit yeah, together yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah but but there was a reason for the like maybe one or two more years maybe i would have gotten but but uh, as young as i was i was the programming didn't stick at all by that point or, or maybe <laughs> it was a primer for when i got completely devoured by it when i was 16. yeah right <laughs> could be could be yeah cool yeah yeah 
that uh, yeah for, for a little warm-up topic there um, so anyways I want to go ahead and move into our cash hit which is our unity dots quick tip of the week um, so this one actually comes from um, go ahead and do this and just share the full screen here. So yeah, this one actually, so yeah, this uh, Dot's quick tip of the week comes from the Unity forums. Um, so someone was go ahead and asked here, uh, is there a way to disable all custom systems at the start of a game? Um, so basically they said that they were using this uh, disable auto creation attribute, which I um, showed as the quick tip of the week last week. Um, you know, but, they have maybe a large number of systems and and they just kind of want to you know make sure they're disabling them all kind of thing um so turtle uh who's kind of very active on the unity forums um basically mentioned that this you can use the assembly info uh, .cs here to basically just apply the disable auto creation uh, attribute to all scripts within the assembly so I can go ahead and just demonstrate that real quick here. So yeah, here we are over in Unity. And then, um, so yeah, I just have this little test system right here. And I should probably zoom in a little bit so you can see. Just have a little test system. And uh, just in the on update, we're just debug.log uh, updating just so we can make sure that this system is actually running. So come over here and I just need to uh, reload the domain here. And then when I go ahead and enter play mode, you'll see that we're just uh, constantly updating right here. Um, now, what I can do is, um, so what I've done here, and this actually might end up being a little bit small, but I'll kind of talk you through what's going on here. So I just have this test directly directory, and we have the uh, test assembly definition file. So I've also created an assembly info.cs which basically just kind of allows you to um, add some additional, you know, attributes, properties, and things like this to the um, assembly definition. So in here, we can go ahead and just basically put this little attribute here where we say, you know, assembly colon disable auto creation. And then now all the scripts within this assembly are basically all, always going to have this disable auto creation attribute in here. So now if we come over here and refresh, I will um, go ahead and whoop, hello. Did I? Okay, <laughs> I thought that crashed. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and enter play mode here and then you'll see we no longer get that updating. So if I clear, then yeah, we don't have that thing saying updating. So it basically just disables everything by default. Um, now, why would you actually want to do this? Um, well, again, if you just kind of want to have a little bit more control over when you're creating systems, um, you know, by default, you can kind of disable them and then kind of use your own methods of creating the systems um, and, and things like that. Now, um, I will also point out over here, um, Dreaming on Latios, uh, another kind of frequent Unity ECS forum contributor. Uh, mentions that you can also get a list of all systems in the iCustom bootstrap and then um, you know you can kind of insert or remove from that list when you're setting up your world so what i've done here is just created this uh little test bootstrap file here so you can see this implements the iCustom bootstrap and then on here you can say get um, a list of all the systems by just doing this default world initialization dot get all systems and I have the world system filter flag set to all. So this like literally just returns all systems. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm just doing, I'm just printing them out um, and then return false. This basically means that um, like this bootstrapper didn't do anything um, because yeah, I'm, I'm not actually like creating any of the worlds or enabling or disabling the systems. I'm not actually doing anything. I'm just custom bootstrappers get, you know, a little bit more in depth so this could be like a, a topic we could go into um, on a different episode but I just kind of wanted to show you that you can kind of get a reference to all these systems here um, so then that's what i'm doing over in unity is just printing them out 
and you see that it um, prints out basically all our, all the systems in the game. So you see there's like the you know tmg.jetbrains talk ones, which are like the ones that I obviously created. Um, there's also like the unity.entities ones. So this is like literally all the systems in the game here. So um, yeah, that's kind of the, the quick tip of the week. Tobias, have you used the um, assembly info stuff for, for anything at all? And it's kind of like one of those um, you know, regular C-sharp features that um, I know most Unity developers don't necessarily always um, kind of use, but I was just curious if you had kind of used this for anything else before. And uh, yes, I have, but I don't remember where. <laughs> Actually, I was just <laughs> looking through my through my source code, and I have a shit ton of them, but I don't remember what they do, uh, or if I do anything specific in any of them. I don't think so. I think I had something at one time, but I I uh, maybe had to rem I did remove it because I had something else. There was something along the lines of generics in in, in dots okay. that was probably kind of early on. Um. I do have everyone to point one thing out with this, uh, like um, control thing about controlling creation of things. Um, uh, I I made the custom bootstrap thing basically by myself, the, mm. because of, uh, <laughs> and I can tell you that um, just to warn people uh, not to go into the thing unless you feel like you actually need it. Not because sometimes you're like, well, I want to do it myself. I want to do it. Uh, set it up exactly as I want it. I don't want to have these order things. That's that's sometimes pops up in my brain at least. So uh, I got to say that bootstrapping all the systems uh, cut with your own code, mm -hmm. uh, if you have everything disabled uh, and not created even, uh, it's not trivial. It's kind of I don't know if you have done it from scratch, but it's it's like it's kind of a lot of stuff to make sure it goes in the right order and everything and, and right, bringing right. everything up it's kind of a tricky so yeah don't uh, don't view this as you can just start <clears> a <throat> system and just start updating stuff however uh, willy-nilly you want because they are very tied together often so it's it's a little bit tricky but other than that it's a very good uh, it's, it's a good way to 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 do that what if you need everything to not start yeah or not yeah. to be created yeah just kind of wanted to yeah point that out to people let them know that that is something that they can do um, again, yeah, you do have to, um, it, like Tobias mentions, it is a little bit more complex because you have to, you know, create all your systems and that's also where you specify any type of like system ordering or system grouping. Um, so, um, yeah, you kind of have, you, you have to be in charge of that. So, um, again, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, nice that unity gives you that option that you can kind of have much more manual control over all that. Um, you know, but a lot of times with that manual control, you have to, you know, you're responsible for everything. So you have to kind of account for all that. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, after that, uh, normally we move into the context switch portion of the show, but um, didn't have any topics that I felt uh, were particularly interesting for the context switch. And I do just want to give uh, Tobias some more um, time to share some things about his new game, Just Read the Instructions. So um, once again, he's gonna be showcasing a couple things within um, his project that he kind of has blocked out already. And then um, also he has just a bunch of other random topics that he can talk about. So if there's anything that anyone in the chat wants to um, just kind of you know ask about if they want to like see how some certain system works, um, he's, he's open to all that. So, so first of all, um, maybe we should post the list uh, somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah. Like of suggested topics. I I realized that maybe not that. Easy. I was gonna even think of. Um, I could maybe even like put up a poll real quick, and then let me see if yeah, I can yeah, sure, figure out how to sure. do that. And then um, that way, yeah, you can just start going, and I'll, and I'll post up a little poll here. I. I I actually didn't have it in a start. I thought that you could just point one that you think is reasonable to start with. Oh, start okay. With. Well, hey, yeah. let me uh, go ahead and grab just my notes here. One, sounds good. And you can figure out the poll while I get revving. Okay. Um, so obviously a, a core part of your game and one of the reasons that you did use um, an ECS-based architecture is so you can have uh, very large numbers of enemies. So I think that's uh, something that I, I want you to dive into is um, kind of, yeah, just your your overall theory for implementing different enemies, 
um, and maybe going into some of the uh, different AI things that you have for them. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I just realized I, I uh, is this how we do it? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Local co-op support. Yes. I hate always online, online uh, multiplayer. <laughs> so you can just connect to an IP address. And if you have the right ports open, the, if you connect to the player who are hosting a custom game or, you know, like a manually created game, you just connect to it and, and it's just you. You don't have to have internet anything. Uh, you can be completely cut off from the world and still play the game. Um, uh, and uh, but it's also fully Steam lobby supported, so you can do everything you expect to in a normal Steam game. Uh, awesome. And then also this is like sort of off topic, but this is almost leads into the idea that we mm -hmm. that you've asked about um, working on Dots mobile game, and I would like to know basic performance related things. So this is this is just like all of dots just explodes into different ideas and it depends a lot of what you want to do uh, and it's just crazy amount of things that you can can learn to do very fast with the dots i'm going to go into how the enemies work now on uh, in, in uh, just read instructions and maybe that is uh, tangent tan, tangential tangential i can't even pronounce that tangentially uh, yeah tangential to to uh, to what you're thinking about and maybe you can find something around that that's relevant yeah so yeah i guess i can start with enemies and and get some um some of that going let me share my screen and i can just jump into it awesome um there we go so let me open uh, crawler.cs so this is just a straight up full thing um it's going to be tricky to navigate this maybe when you're uh have this uh, weird resolution thing for the stream but it's probably going to be just fine let's see here crawler states so uh the crawlers uh maybe i can just show them real quickly here uh, and we can uh, i can explain while it loads uh, so the crawlers, they are the things that uh, move around and they, they were like sort of the start initial idea of the whole game uh, to have a basic enemy that is like cannon fodder and use dots to be able to have as many of them as possible. So the limiting factor here is uh, is the networking. So that means that uh, the, the maximum number is 4096, which is, you know, a uh, power of two number. And that's the maximum number of crawlers I can have. And uh, they all work by just uh, ray casting straight down and just following any surface. So they work upside down uh, or whatever angle they need. And they basically use two, three ray casts, one in front and two in the back. And that, that algorithm is very, very fine tuned to make them not like lose grip of the ground, but they do that often sometimes as anyway. But since there are so many, I can, if I, detect that they are like losing ground or whatever i just despawn them and spawn another one uh, they are very much uh, throw out and just spawn another one if i if if they bug out or something so they are di dime a dozen and you can shoot basically hundreds of them in each shot of the shotgun if you want to uh they die super quickly uh, they die all of them in die in one shot and all of them are just a sphere collider uh so you can imagine how how simple that is basically so now we're generating the map inside uh, oh that's part of the thing the every map is generated in the loading screen um so here is the game oh damn this is laggy <laughs> maybe my computer won't be able to deal with this burst is on uh yeah this won't be playable Ah, oh, that's too bad. It's usually it's kind of playable on my laptop. I can see if I can walk in and, and just spawn a few of the guys. Let's see here. Ah. Uh, so this is how a map looks. And this is generated in the loading screen, as I said. And uh, I can maybe just uh, add a few. Uh, add some intensity so we get some enemies going and i can show how they look and gone with you let's see here 
Ah, this won't really show it very well since it's so laggy. Holy damn, it's laggy. My laptop is really not liking doing all of this at the same time. Yeah, I wonder um, if it's doing streaming as well. That uh... Yeah, maybe that's the problem. Maybe we should just, um, I, I can, I'll pull up the, the YouTube. Um, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. I can pull it up. Yeah, you just yeah, want the yeah, YouTube trailer? Yeah, I just want the YouTube trailer. I'll, I'll just have it uh, also here. Uh, and by the way, I should mention that um, I did also put up the uh, uh, poll for uh, what topics that you want to hear Tobias talk about next. It looks like a couple people have already voted. So uh, just, yeah, in the chat, go ahead and select if you want um, to talk about networking, animation, database events, or level generation. Yeah. And, and all of them have this, so, it's so deep uh, into all of the different topics. So it's like hard to know which part of it, uh, but I will try to see uh, where I can get to it. Yeah, so, uh, oh, did I press something wrong here? I think you, yeah, oh, I, yeah we're fighting was... now. <laughs> so just these guys, I thought I would be able to, yeah. So here we can see them. So you can see they have for like four, four arms or four legs and right. they just follow the ground mm -hmm. uh, they just rake us down so let, let's talk about how they are made to be so efficient that i can have four thousand of them at the same time uh i, I um, should i do you want me to focus on the processor side or networking side i guess the processing side is more dots related yeah yeah i'd be curious about that and by the way are you using uh dots physics to do all the different ray casts or are you getting yeah, to that yeah all of it is dots physics there's Sweet. very little actual physics it's mostly just uh, ray casting all of it like the, the the basically only the character and items that you can pick up use physics all of the other thing is just colliding and ray casting right right uh but so th there's a few little like trick here that's really strange uh, so first of all so because like the crawler is like a very fairly complex but contained type of a thing they, they, it's not like uh, um, it, it shares a bunch of functionality with other stuff in the in the game uh, all of it is just squeezed into a single i component data because there's no reason really to split it up there's a few times where I just pick out pick out a few options out of it, but when I do the full like um, the full update loop on it, I just use all of the data at the same time. So I just squeezed all of it in, and this might be a little bit strange to most people. So I have like position and rotation straight up uh, here. I don't use local rotation uh, or local transform. Yeah, because. Yeah. What happens is um, when you pull in local transform uh, as the component uh, into something, then everything else that uses local transform will also be de dependent on you being done with it. So you're like, oh, I, I need to work on local transforms on the, on the crawlers, uh, but all other local transforms are locked in the dependency system. So if you if you want something to be like, oh, this lives a little bit of its own life. Uh, it has a bunch of stuff that like reminds uh, reminds of the rest of the systems, but it's still like its own little box of feature sets, which the crawlers are. Then you can just like take whatever thing that normally maybe transforms and stuff that are outside of the system, uh, and you can just do it yourself and get rid of all the dependencies on the normal components that the rest of the system uses and the rest of the system also wants to hug, uh, hug like, uh, yeah, depend on. So both position and rotation here is completely uh, done like this. And also a small detail is rotation is before position because uh, in a struct, this was something we talked about a while ago, in a struct, you should always order the biggest types first because of how it's laid out in memory. Uh, so that means that the quaternion, which is a float four in the bottom, it's better to have it above, even though rotation often is declared below because it's like position is the most significant one. So they are this way around. Uh, 
And then, so, so that's part of the thing that I do to make it super, super efficient is that I have their own position and, and rotation. And if we take a look at, um, at, at the position here, we can go into um, uh, crawler movement and go all the way down somewhere here. This class is gigantic, or this <laughs> job is gigantic. This is the whole movement say. job. Yeah. So here we have, here we have the chunk. So uh, the, the the local to world chunk. And for those who know, local to world is the thing that uh, makes it be able to render on the screen. Uh, so I still use that because local to world, uh, the rendering system needs to have that. Unless you're going to write some own some custom rendering code, right, and that's just right. that's very very tedious. Uh, but then I have this um, dependency to this stuff uh, right here. So I have a dependency to local to world. So I, I, I skip the local transform dependency, but I still have some sort of write dependency to local to world to be able to write this. But not really, because I'm being very unsafe here. So this is um, this is code that my, I might not recommend people, but <laughs> the, the, the advanced people can just get a unsafe hint stuff. This that, that this is possible to do. So unsafe stuff, basically, I just send in like the chunk I'm working on and the type I want out and then a, and then a syst uh, type uh, version thing. And then inside of here, this is, uh, I get just a pure byte pointer strictly to the array, which just points to all of the local to world uh, components like straight in a row in an array. And uh, I just pick it out without letting the dependency system know about it but since i'm working only with the craw uh, crawlers i know that i'm working with my own chunks and nobody else is meddling with it so but that's that's very advanced but that's a very good way of dealing with that if, uh, if you really have your own isolated type that you really executes their own stuff and don't really care about anything else otherwise otherwise it's not that complicated conceptually how it's done. So I have this job call and movement, which implements just the, the normal execute update function. Uh, and that's, this is just a bunch of movement code, a ton of different ray costs everywhere, um, and just calculates where where am I at, where am I going? It's just movement code, like it's ray cost down, like, oh, do I find the ground? I found the ground behind, I calculate approximately where my normal is, and then I have a speed, and I just move uh, perpendicular to that normal. And then that next frame, I check the same thing, right? Uh, so that means, you can see here, I I, um, I do this, uh, let's see here, find, uh, blah, 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 blah. I can't find it now. Find the ground, it, there's some ray cast somewhere uh, where I just find the ground. Uh, do all raycasts. Yeah, so I just do a bunch of raycasts straight into. Um, uh, oh, uh, this is. Yeah, I'm 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 realizing complicated stuff. Let's not go into that. Uh, but there's there's a bunch of optimization there. But but generally speaking, it's just make sure that you have uh, all your um, that you have the um, the data pretty pretty tight. So so. Um, the, the crawler doesn't need a ton from anywhere else. It's just it, all all it needs is like maybe the collision world where everything is and its own state. So it doesn't like depend too much on other components outside because that's random access memories, which will make a higher chance of cache miss. And, and cache miss, that's where you're going to just throw away your performance if you have 4,000 of these guys updating. Uh, but yeah, so it's a big movement job. Uh, it's ran uh, just like a uh, schedule parallel thing, uh, like normal. Um, and and like I said, the, the only really important stuff is that you need to make sure that it's like a, the, 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 the heavy stuff that's done needs to be contained and not too small spread out. So for example, the, com the, the collision world that, that I use Unity's own in physics collision thing, uh, that is inherently a random access memory problem because you're like, you're ray casting there and there and then you're hitting colliders and they just random access in the memory. 
Uh, and and that is that is optimized by them just squeezing together the data as much as possible. That's like super utilized memory space. Uh, um, and and we don't have that luxury, but we can at least make sure that we're not depending on other stuff around us. So um, make sure that your dependencies is straightforward, so you don't depend on something. Because sometimes you can like, oh, I'm I'm starting this job, and it depends on this other thing, uh, and then we have to wait for that, and then maybe we we start doing the job, and then and then something else depends on me, and that waits, and then you like sort of just mess up the parallelism of it because stuff are depending on the same thing so they can't do that they can't work on at the same time and this is super important to work with a profiler to understand mm -hmm. uh, I, I bet you've seen in the profiler sometime how it's like ah, oh, that this just is a long running thing why is it oh it was waiting for something else to right be done. yeah you see it's, it's like yeah waiting. waiting for a job to complete yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so so um so, so that's super important. I even have this. Is, this is kind of a fascinating thing. So um, we have initialization system group, we have simulation system group, and the presentation system group. So Correct, in yeah. it, simulate and then pres present. I have a subgroup that is very relevant here uh, because the crawlers are such a major part of the uh, of the update loop. I have this thing execute during crawler system group. Mm. So if we take a look at that, that's inside of the simulation system group. Mm -hmm. It's after the, the, the fixed, so the physics, mm -hmm. and it's before the transformation system group. And then I have end crawler system, which is, you know, uh, so after all the, after some groups, there is a possibility of executing a command buffer to make sure that you're like locking in all the changes straight right. away. After yeah. the, the so you have your and, own. Kind of I have my own thing. Basically built in entity command buffer. Yeah, so I have like two different steps of parallelism in the in the in the update in the simulation group. So like you have the core simulation thing and there we have all of all of different things spread out including transform systems and and the physics. But then I have this major thing which is the crawlers and everything that the everything that I can think of that is completely irrelevant or unconnected to the crawlers, I just put into the execution, execute during crawler system group. And if for some reason it doesn't execute properly, if I get that waiting for job, then I know the dependencies are not properly set up and I need to you know, cut that dependency because in, in principle in my head, like, oh, in principle, the, the, the F mod, the sound update, should not depend on the crawlers. So I just put it inside of an uh, executor and make sure that everything I can come up with that can execute after physics and before transform group. So here we got all of them or like all of one, which is I can do maybe like that and I can, yeah. So Dang. all of these in group. So yeah. I have like slow system, analog clock, gravity effector, item collector, wind turbine. It's a sh ton of different stuff. <laughs> And all of these are just completely parallel to the full, to all of the crawlers. And the crawlers is possibly like when you have like a thousand on the screen, mm -hmm. it's maybe like two, three, maybe five milliseconds, which is a significant part of the update. So I need to make sure that all of these Other guys things just, can happen. Yeah, can during happen, that, not the panel. Yeah, that, that's, that's smart. That, that's smart because yeah, you're not like slotting it somewhere else in the frame where you have to like wait for this even though it could run in parallel with all that stuff so yeah 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 may, uh, i'm just reading maybe maximize the game you could be inspector using resources uh, i think that was for the yeah the yeah when i, I realized that yeah, yeah yeah but but um yeah good point but i know that this runs fairly good if i have all of the um, uh, the inspectors uh, so I think it's just a streaming just hogs everything but uh, I think I will be able to explain stuff so yeah that's that's the performance side that's the basic performance side and there's another thing which is actually kind of fascinating um I'm gonna try to explain this it's a little bit tricky uh, but I think I can manage it and I think that um, you'll probably find this fascinating so Johnny um You've made a bunch of Raycast stuff in your in your time, right? I have. Yeah. So if you 
if you're ray casting, you need to go through a bunch of different. Um, this uh, that's something called a binary um, uh, uh, volume volume. What's it called BVH tree uh, bounding volume hierarchy. That's how right. it's called. Yeah, yeah. So that that's the stuff that the, the acceleration structure behind most collision uh, struct, uh, st collision engines. So physics, the old one in Unity traditional, and Unity physics, both of them use binding uh, volume hierarchies. Uh, so you need to go through that to find what you're hitting. But if you hit something, you get back uh, information of what, what you hit, right? So the next frame, if you want to check, am I still hitting that? You could be just looking straight up to the same to the same object that you hit and check the ray cast on only that and not traverse the whole system because you maybe you have something that moves very slowly. You mean ray cast basically just against one object? Against the exact object that you found the last frame. Makes sense a little bit, right? It does, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The problem is that, you know, so imagine, let's see if I can show this in, on the screen. Imagine you're like, you're ray casting here, and you found that. And then you have something else that comes like this, right? Yeah. And here you found the ray cast. And when you go here, you, so you move forward and your ray mm -hmm. cast comes in, then you're still going to hit this plane. Right. But there's another plane that just got on top of it. Mm. So then you don't hit that one. Right. So you're still technically just ray casting against that first object. So it's going through that new slanted so object. You get a, you, you get a false, a false positive. positive. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, but the crawlers are optimized in this way. There's one edge case where they would just continue going through collision because they don't realize they have another thing that they're supposed to walk on top of. But they have this exact optimization where they like, okay, I'm going to, so, so they have three ray costs and they record whatever key and what, whatever stuff they find with the first ray cost. Uh, and, and next frame, if they found, find the exact same collision hits. So all of the different ray costs hit the same collision key. Then they just, ah, whatever. If there's some, uh, something else in between me and the other one, I don't care about it. I just continue on the flat surface. And because of how my, my geometry is structured, that happens very rarely. So it's like a very rare collision uh, situation. But I can, I can show you a little bit here. So let's see where it's at. Um, uh, position, collider key. So here. Uh, and now I can't find it. Yeah, process ray cost. So here we have like a cache that says like, oh, that was the last frame's body. Mm -hmm. So we can we can check in the collision map and find the exact body that we that we picked, hit last frame. Like, oh, is it still there? Yes, it's still there. So we take that and we find the actual like something called ray cost leaf so that's like the end of the bounding volume hierarchy it's like is oh, that a is, like... is that a built-in thing or is that something that you implemented the ray cast leaf uh i yeah i implemented this okay uh i i, I haven't seen this code in in like two years <laughs> i'm just yeah but this so so here we have so i i can say i can say uh, you can see this one uh, this is inside of so that's collider. inside Unity. Yeah, get get leaf a leaf collider. of a collider hierarchy. Return false if the key is not valid. So you send in the root collider, the key, and the transform of it, so you know how to check for it, uh, and then you get the leaf back. So you can see like uh, that. Do I still hit this? Is basically the question. Um, no, no, don't. No, never mind. N not do I still hit this? I I just get out the actual the actual object that you can ray, uh, ray cast against. Okay. And then I use that left collider and I ray cast against it. So this is like inner type of ray casting. Um, basically what I'm telling is like, I wrote some code that makes sure that like, okay, I can check if I have the exact same collision set up the next frame. If I, if I hit all in the exact same set 
then I pretend there's nothing that could have come in between me and my my collider I'm stuck on or my colliders that I'm stuck on. And I can just ignore trying to traverse the whole hierarchy and I can just continue working, work, work, walking on that surface. And that's actually like a fascinating thing with how open the, uh, the Unity physics engine is because these kind of things ray cost so this is like a ray cost implementation on it's easier to see here on a collider and it's like you can just like oh this single collider i can just call its actual ray cost uh test that that the system is using behind the scenes when you're doing a world ray cost but you can like pick out this one object and you can try with your ray cost just on that one if you want to you have access to all those like integrate parts of the engine and like can pick them out and like, okay, I know I'm close to this collider. Let me just try on this collider, just this collider and not go through your whole world query. Do you get it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's that's also like a, a, a very heavy- Good efficiency gain, yeah. Yeah, if, if, I, if I ignore more edge cases, then I'm like doubling their efficiency because the world ray cost is by far the heaviest thing to simulate my crawlers. And I, I, I think I even do like crawler uh, ray cost every other frame for the crawlers because it's so heavy. So I, I like accept they can go through material materia for one frame if they want to. Gotcha. Do you remember yeah. how much of an efficiency gain um, implementing this kind of provided in compared to maybe like a more naive solution or you're just kind of shooting out a ray cast into the world and not going against a specific thing? Well, it depends on what the crawlers are doing. But if you have a big mm. surface and it's just one big plane that they're ray casting against and you have like 500 crawlers on that surface and you walk over it and they were, then you sort of you get a, like 10x improvement because they don't go through the whole collision tree, right? They just like shake again. Am I still on this spot? Yes, I'm still on this spot. And it's much, much faster. So yeah, uh, th that's another optimization. Uh, but otherwise, um, the big thing with crawlers are make sure it's uh, isolated data, not spread out uh, and uh, paralyze it. Make sure it doesn't depend on anything. It's, the, the dependency tree is very, very tricky to get in to, to be sh when you have a complex system. So make sure it runs parallel with everything you expect it to run parallel with and, uh, and then burst it. <laughs> Don't forget to burst it. Don't forget to burst it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, that's, uh, I, and it's like, it's, it's, it's tricky to go into super high detail. I don't know where to stop really exactly, but I guess this is a kind of a good overview of the different concepts that's involved to making this happen. Yeah, no, no, I, I like that a lot. And yeah, it sounds like most of these efficiency gains that you kind of have implemented, it was because you know you were doing you know specific profiling and looking into your profiler and seeing, you know, this is an issue, um, you know, how can I solve it? And, um, you know, again, He's not saying that, you know, every time that you're doing some raycasts, you should implement some solution like this where you're, you know, storing the last one and kind of doing more a more efficient raycast on it. You know, but for your specific game, you noticed that, that that was an issue and you found that you got like, you know, significant um improvements by by doing this. So um yeah, yeah. just kinda keep yeah. that all in mind. You know what? I think I think I can just jump on a second part, uh, another thing inside of that list that's very very relevant to making the crawlers work well. Okay, uh, it's like tied in between. So I think I had somewhere in the list data based um, events or well, something. Well, that is perfect because that is currently leading in the poll right now. So <laughs> really, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is, you know, riffing off when you talked about how you, when you talked about how damage propagation in your like uh, damage system, I don't remember exactly what you call everything, but it's like a pretty good way of dealing with damage. And yeah. Kind of like the capability system and, and uh, having the damage events and all that. Yeah. 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 So, so let, let's just get a few ground rules here around how, how, how we should view this problem. So first of all, um, problem with the crawlers, or not, not the biggest problem, but 
maybe the biggest I haven't really seen, but one of the actually biggest thing isn't really the movement code. Uh, that is uh, continuously updating, right? And doing all uh, every frame. And it's very, very necessary to optimize as fast, fast as possible. Uh, but an equally big problem is the cascade of things that happens when you kill them or something else would happen with them. So imagine when you shoot one crawlers, you're supposed to have a sound, a VFX, and then maybe count up some counter that you call, call uh, that kill them, and then maybe call uh, spawn some remnant of some sorts. So there's like, and, and imagine you're having like a shotgun and you shoot like 100 projectiles and you kill like 50 crawlers at the same time. And then all the crawlers have like, I don't know, 10 different sub things that happens because of their death. Then you get like maybe 500 they play an animation or do some sound effects or um add to the yeah. score of the player or something yeah oh uh, uh, animation let's let's keep that on the back burner i can show you how they are <laughs> animated after we're done with this one cool uh but but yeah the, the cascade effect is it's it's very very hard to deal with uh, and in unity in traditional unity you have the problem like oh i want to have a lot of enemies and then you shoot one and you make a really cool effect and then you put in the death effect and then you put in 100 enemies and you throw a grenade and it's just like lag spikes because you yeah, are yeah, instancing yeah. 500 explosions unity game object dot instancing is like the slowest shit ever it's super bad <laughs> uh but uh dots doesn't really solve it all the way either you still have to deal with you know effects and stuff that is not dots compatible right. yet yeah, yeah, yeah. and and even if everything was dots you still would probably run into issues with the frame dip uh, or spikes when you have this cascade so how do we deal with this uh part of it would would be like to 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 um, rate limit it over frames and that's also something i do uh and that's you can imagine how that is you have a backlog and you know if you go over a certain th threshold you throw it into the backlog right, and you wait right. for the next frame and stuff like that smart, uh, yeah. but but this cascade part of the reason why it can be so slow is if you use slow systems like en entity command buffers mm. entity command buffers is great when you're dealing with and is very very versatile when you're doing this the, the example you had last time uh then it's a perfect solution for it but if you have 50 of them having at the same time then in the same frame that's going to be a problem um so now it's the data without entity remember one of the reasons why entity is a thing is because you needs to be globally addressable like you have this entity you have a bunch of data connected to it and you want to be able to identify that one right that's part of the reason why you have it as an entity. Right. But in your case, with your damage, or with my case with damage, or with something else, like an event that happens, the identification of the of the of the event does is not necessary. It's just like this victim got hurt with this damage. Like the 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 the, the identity of that data is not really relevant. It's just like you got hurt like my my identity as a messenger is irrelevant in that case so you have this entity with an id that is perfectly globally addressable com has no real use like when you when you read the the incoming damage events you didn't care about the the entity index right it's it's you know you have a, you have your damage and you have the target which take the damage and that's it Right. right. Yeah. I, I think in that case I didn't, but um, I do see that there are like some times where you do, where you might want that information as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but also like, uh, also um, there's a difference here. You, you don't necessarily need to be globally identified. You could have a local okay. identification, but entities is globally identified amongst every entity in the whole system right right and right, that's right, not right. really relevant for a lot of st stuff and and this applies to a lot of situation like uh, ask yourself before you make it an entity like is this really needed to be identified or can i like do it without this global identification process so so let's take a look at the damage events because that's one of those things so if we look at this one uh we have a few things here we have some uh, information about the position 
like where it's got hit. It's, so this is like a damage event. So where did the damage occur? Then we have an attacker, which is an entity. We have a victim, and we have a possible sub part. And then we have some some a reason. So this is like removed, killed, self detonation, stuff like that. Um, and we have uh, some other data, and we have the damage. Could be a good thing to have here also, right? But if we look at this, it's not an I component data, right? So what's happening here is that I just have a native queue of that. And when I do something, let's see here if I can find some place where it's used. Oh, I, this is only on self-detonation. So this is not really, really the most relevant part of the system, but uh, basically only self-detonation. Um, this is when I kill myself, basically, or ki the crawler kills itself. Um, so I just enqueue this, and this is you know a parallel writer. So I I, I send in an um, let's see here damage signal. Was it that one? Yeah, that one. Uh, so I have this um, damage signal system which grabs me a native queue. It creates a git native queue for me, adds it to a list, and sends then the parallel writer version of it. So my crawler system can just, just start putting in damage event into that one if they want to. If, there's, if they want to uh, self-destruct, they just, oh, this is my event that I want to self-destruct. And they identify themselves and they send it away. And this signal system, it's a, it's a, it's a signal system that I built that is based on the, uh, on the system base, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, like, this, it just, it just has, like, a way to create native buffers or native native queues uh, with a, spe a specified a specified type, and and so you just like ask all of the system. Uh, you ask for this uh, this this a queue and say mm -hmm. like I want the queue with 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 this stuff and I want to produce it, and then when you. Um, Let's see here. <laughs> it's it's tricky with this uh, resolution thing. I'm sorry if I'm being slow here. Uh, it's uh, and then when I get to the update of this function uh, of this system, um, I come here and I then have the uh, damage system. Where is it? Data buffer, a lot of stuff here. So here, here I have the list of native queues. So different systems all over the frame have created. I want a native queue, and they fill damage events into it. Um, and they, and and then I go through all of them, and I pick them out as arrays. So this is just to convert a native queue to an array, and I put them into this list, a big list, uh, a list of a list actually. But I just make sure that I, I accumulate everything in a list that is easy to digest. And then I I consume them in a job. So I just have this job which contains just a big, big native array of all the damage events. But here's tr here's the thing. Like all of this system produces these damage events, which is just structs straight up in native in native collections. And nowhere in this whole system is there ever a structural change because this has nothing to do with ECS. So when I when I pick this out um, damage signal, you know I got all of this data. Um, if it wanna give me yeah the attacker the the net ID the damage and all of this it's just it's it's there for me I can just go through it easily and but. There's nothing around here. There's a component. It's just they, right, and now you don't yeah. have to worry about dependencies or anything. It's just all yeah, yeah. And 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 this isn't uh, this isn't uh, paralyzed this code here because you can't do that. You need to have a single frame. So so when I apply the damage on the different stuff, then that could obviously be uh, structural changes. 
but that's like applying the damage in the end. That's just using the data, the the the, the communication of the data, the, the pulling all the data into a single point and then just like dealing with it. All of that is completely everywhere in this whole game, uh, void of any structural changes. And that's true for like most of the events in the whole system. There's like two or three events where I use entity entities to like have a handle for it mm. but that's for other like reasons and that's often like events that rarely happens like these these guys this the the, the damage event that can spew like tens and hundreds of them every frame sometimes and it just doesn't take a it's no it's not a hiccup not, not a single like zero 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 point zero one ms nothing it's just because it's so fast to deal with data like structural changes on the on the in the ecs is is heavy and and you should just try to avoid that completely uh, if you have a system that will just chug on with tens and tens every frame you can just avoid creating entities unless unless you want them i globally identified that like we talked about uh but so when when I remember when we talked about this and I said I can I can bring up how how you can do this without entities and somebody said like yeah how could you do that but I think I think data oriented design you need to like everybody needs to like think about like what what data do I actually need right well, I need the, the damage and I need the targets that's yeah. it data oriented the design entity. isn't isn't about you know using an entity component system for everything it's about looking at the data that you have and then how do you most efficiently process that you know sometimes yeah ecs is going to be a great solution for it um but you know i, I really like you know a couple of things that you've showed where you're just kind of ignoring some of the unity ecs stuff and say no like the more efficient way is to do it this way and that's how i'm going to do it yeah yeah and and um uh, uh like like there's a lot of times where where having it attached to an entity makes it like go through different channels in a very nice way so for example like you know you have the query system where you can just get the thing that you want and if you have a if you if it's slightly complex where you have like the entity and you can like put on some some damage on it you can put up a debuff on it you can put up something else and you can like build a, a complex event of it that then like deals some some effect to the to the enemy, and I think that partly what you did with your system. So that that type of a, like a building block system where you can like build up the event to be more than just the damage event. In that case, it's very good. But but re also realize that um, you could also just shove all that data into the same structure, right? And just have one structure, one behemoth structure, right? And just yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it in. And, and maybe behemoth structure, even the word sounds like a bad idea performance wise, but possibly it can be faster because you don't have any structural changes. No, I, and I've heard of that kind of being a viable solution for other different types of things where people, you know, just basically make like a mega struct that contains like every single bit of yeah. data that you would want to track. And, you know, if there's a flag set in there, you know, handle what you need to. Um, but yeah, and also I know another thing that you've kind of mentioned about is like the you know cascading events, and I know your friends over at Stunlux Studios have done some interesting things with the some of the cascading events that they kind of were talking about. I think on that uh, live stream that they did with Unity uh, quite a while ago that um, is now up on their their YouTube channel. Yeah. Oh right, yeah. I, I bet they have a ton of that because they they don't have as much enemies as me, but the cascading events is probably like five times more complex than what I have because yeah. it's a, a lot more complex game. <laughs> yeah, uh, we can we can just take a quick look into the signal system here. Uh, it could be uh, named event system just as well. I just wanted to distinguish in my mind when I from when like I the wrote. keyword event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but here we have uh, I have two different ways of dealing with this, which is this is a very fascinating thing and i can explain kind of quickly but here we have just like the the, the, the um the list and since since this is not a lot of stuff inside of here uh, i can just use a managed list and i don't have to deal with unsafe lists which is the only thing that can be nested like this gotcha. so i just have a normal list it doesn't really matter nice, uh, yeah. and it won't be that many it's it's only as many as there are system who uses this every frame so maybe like five or something okay uh, 
yeah but otherwise i have this i i, I thought about like uh so when you go into like a like a uh we can we can look at the shotgun gun that's yes um so if we take a look at this one uh we have all of these different signal systems. So here we have all of this works the same way. So we have, you know, particle producer, camera shake, dust simulation. So that's for when you shoot, you blow out the dust around you. Uh, VFX, uh, play, muscle flash. Yeah, those are the ones that I have here. Um, and and this one, this update loop can run run once for every shotgun, right? So that means mm -hmm. that they can at maximum be four of these running every frame because there's four players and there's and everybody can have one shotgun. So it feels silly to me to to create a full native queue for this single update loop, which can really so, so imagine all of these would create a thing in one uh, one native queue each. To put into this one for them to produce their their output signal like the like the damage native queue that i showed all of these guys could be the, that native queue um but it feels silly to give them i don't know six different native queues and then all of the other all of the other uh, um, guns have the similar thing where they also you know need their respective things so then it just becomes a frenzy of, uh, of native queues all over the place uh, for just a few few entities, you know, for a cro full four shotgun maximum, which is silly. So I created this other thing, which is a uh, signal slots. So if we go to this one, this is basically like a struct that has a reference to an unsafe list, and then it has a reference to a bit array, which is just you know, on-off switches. And then when you when you when you ask for this signal slot. Uh, you get back a this 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 uh, component or this this struct, which is like okay. So I I have reference to this big single array, and I just reference the start index here, and then you have access to four slots. And then the next the next thing that calls this same signals get signal slots it just gets the next set of four slots in this it's big just array. Kind of increments that. Yeah. So 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 all of the all of the uh, um, weapons, uh, basically all of them have like the VFX thing where they produce VFX, for okay. example. Yeah. And they all just share the same unsafe list of a bunch of of, of slots where they can every frame like shove in like. I want this effect. I want this effect. So and and this is you know just kept alive, and and just cleared out for every frame. Mm. So I'm just like handing them shotgun. You have these four. Say tell me if you need any any effect, and then and and that can you know happen in parallel with anybody else because they I disabled all the safety systems around that. So 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 all the all the different guns can just like. They have they have their little space in this list and and that's it and uh, that way for all of these tiny tiny systems that just produce a little bit they don't need their own native queue they just get a little bit slice of a diff of, of an uh, of a bigger list and I realize as I speak about this that this could possibly be done with native slice. Mm. I didn't know about native slice when I wrote this like three years ago, so. Maybe you have to delay the game by another week or so to <laughs> no, change no. it. Yeah, so many times I passed it out, but but yeah. So so that's 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 the that that's that's very much. There's no magic to it. That's like just have lists with the stuff you need to do, and then you know like okay, shove the stuff into this list which you wanna which you want to happen, and I'll read it when you're done. That's that's the basic thing. You just need to shove in data, uh, shove data through native lists. Just communicate as much as possible between different stuff with just data in lists. You don't need entities ent ent for a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of ways where entities, uh, where going outside of the entities are the most horrible and annoying thing ever, and you should never do it. But there's also stuff where you will never read the index of the entity. You will never care that identity of it, point, it yeah. won't matter. Yeah. So every time you don't have you don't need entity, 
just yeah you can just it, regular, it will yeah. take longer to code but it's not that bad and it will be just void it, it's not like you don't need even need the structural change you just there's there's it won't affect anything it's just your data here in this array that's it <laughs> so yeah that's how you do events without entities that's a great point. And then, um, so as far as like processing those events go, do you just have like some kind of system that that iterates through that full list? We can we can take a look at the VFX because that that's uh, pretty uh, uh, VFX if I can spell right system. Yeah, we can just do a quick, a pretty, uh, quick pretty one straightforward that. here. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, blah 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 blah. On stop running, clear effects. I got some. This is you know managed game object types. It's the VFX right, graph. Right, right, right. Uh, so there's a bunch of caching here. There's no other way to do it. So I, I instant like 256 bullets on startup and just keep them <laughs> disabled. But I don't know. There's nothing to do about that. Uh, so here we have um, update. So this is a little bit like. Um, generalized in a way that may be hard to follow, but we should basically just look at like maybe process queue uh, or process list. Uh, so uh, imagine this being just the loop around all of the all of the stuff that you produced. It's just a little bit abstracted here. Uh, but so this is just an, a native list of the signal create effect. And we can look at, into that. And we have like an owner event ID, owner net ID. We have the position. And this one isn't actually ordered by size, I realize now. This is an old struct. I should just reorder it so it's more effective on the in the space wise. Although I think I think C sharp might kind of do some of that ordering behind the scenes for you, as long as you're not specifying the ordering. No, no, it's actually doing um, it, it's it's explicitly through exact same order that's as C has because it wants intercopability with C and C plus hmm. plus. So it's 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 doing a specific ordering, which is hmm. you you can do explicit ordering and make it better uh, and make it exact as you want. But right now, this is probably maybe twice as big as it should be because hmm. I can see like a quaternion in here that just screws up all the ordering very hard. This one is two, two, um, like 64 bits, and this one is 32, so already there. But that's complicated. Anyway, it's not really that relevant. It doesn't matter that much. But if you have 10,000 of them, then you should order it properly to make sure that it doesn't take up extra space. Yeah. But uh, I'm pretty sure that C Sharp runtime by default doesn't reorder anything in sizes. Uh, but uh, I might be wrong. Maybe some updates. Um, Anyway, this is not really relevant. So this is the thing that I'm sending out. So the big thing that's really uh, relevant here is position, rotation, and effect type. And we can just see this. This is just a long list of all the effects in the game. Not a lot, actually. Well, there's a lot of other effects, but not in the system. Uh, so I produce this, and I say where it is supposed to be, what scale, lifetime, and all that stuff, all that nice. And uh, then when I consume them, I have this list. Process create sign signal. Then I just, uh, this is a special case for optimization. Bullet hit concrete, a lot of them. So I have a very specific type of way of doing that. But otherwise, uh, I, uh, yeah, here we go. So create event. I have a function that gets the exact event cached. So here's the instance of the visual event, visual effect event. A uh, visual effect, not the event anymore. It's the actual game object that's supposed to be shown. So, and it might be cached, might be created if I already ran out of them. Uh, and then I reinitialize it, I play it, I put it on the right place, and I set all the stuff that I can do if I have something to set the floats, length, and power, and lifetime, and all of that. And if it have, has an owner, I make sure to pick out the owner's position and um, uh, or if if I, if it has an owner, then I start tracking it. So I have like a tracking system where it's like uh, this entity owns a few effects, and every frame I need to update the effects with the position of the entity, right? Uh, so, but if it doesn't have an owner, it's just a one shot, and it's just like bam, and when it's over, it gets destroyed. But it, there's nothing more than this. Like this, you can go into this one as well. This is a type. It's just a big cache. 
if I have any o um, any, any available, uh, I pop one from the cache instance. I activate it. I turn on the lights if it's the lights inside of the effect, and then I return it, and then I do whatever I need with it. So there's like this consuming of effects of of events. That's just you just pick out the list that's filled in with stuff you need to do, yeah. and you just start straightforward. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah, good straightforward yeah. solution. Uh, yeah, but it, 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 there's there's surprisingly little amount of magic behind any of this, <laughs> uh, and I guess that's once again the and they are in the design. It's a little bit uh, anticlimactic in, in in certain situations because it's just there's no abstractions in a okay, lot of situations. Just just, throw it in an array and iterate the array. Boom. Yeah. Easy. Yeah, and that's what's fastest on a computer. CS one one stuff. So. Yes. Yes. Indeed. Um, yeah, I guess that's uh, the events system, sort of, or signal, or cool. data. I no, I, I, I like that approach a lot. Um, so yeah, next up, uh, we do have a tie in the poll. So we have uh, whatever you think is kind of logical to uh, go uh, into next. I, I should just, uh, I had a back burner thing with the, the, the how I animate with the ma uh, material properties. Okay, uh, so yeah, I, yeah, I was gonna say it's between animation and level generation. So and I know you wanted to talk about animation, so we can go into we that. We can if go you want. into that, Sweet. and that's probably not that not that uh, long either. So uh, let's look here. Um, we have. I definitely uh, want to see some of the level generation animator. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's make sure we have time for that. Uh, what's the time? Oh yeah. So we yeah, get plenty of time. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so material property property overrides well now it's called only material properties but it used to be called override also um for those who doesn't know quick quick uh, you can google this and find all of it but basically it means like uh if you have a float float two float three or float four by four maybe there's other supported i don't know uh, uh if you have a single one of these in a component uh, you can just add this attribute and name it something. And if you go to the shader where that's rendering the same mesh uh, that this component is attached to, so the entity that's getting rendered with this crawler leg positions attached to it, that shader then will get access to this exact value through this name, like a shader variable. So dots with this property just say like, okay, here we have all of these components. Let's just boop, copy them over to the GPU. And then the shader like, okay, I have, and there's instanced rendering and they just can like pick out uh, their, their respective data point in the array and just render all the entities with their respective uh, component data uh, just through this name. Um, so what I do is that we can take a look here. Uh, well, it's just further down in the same file. If I don't remember, if I yeah. So and this isn't uh, too much to read, but this is basically the the and the, the the crawlers. Uh, so this is all the crawlers, and they got a little bit of a, a dynamic buffer with the, the leg positions. Uh, and they got this uh, leg, uh, crawler leg positions, the, the, an actual one uh, component. Uh, I, I realize now this could also be just one component. It doesn't have to be a dynamic buffer, but that's a little bit legacy thing. Um, the dynamic buffer can't be sent over to the GPU. So I, I, I um, so, so uh, any, any dynamic stuff in dynamic sizes can't be sent over to the GPU that mm. easily. Uh, so I think I started with this one with a dynamic buffer for the legs all the way, and then I sent it over somehow. But now it's done through this material property. Okay, so cool. I, I basically, the crawler is walking, and it sends out four different rays back and front. And it doesn't do it all the time, because it's just only when it's like gets farther away, so it needs to like replace its foot. Kind of like and an IK can... solution almost, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it, it does some ray costing and then it fills it in with the, with, with the position of the leg. Well, it goes through all the legs here. 
so that's why it looks a little bit wonky but this is the leg offset which is uh, red yeah uh, somewhere here is a ray cost there is a ray cost so it finds the ground and it's like oh this is supposed to be that that's the place where the leg is supposed to be and that's just a 3d position there's no rotation to anything here uh so i just fill in this uh wrong one leg state uh i i can't even find my own code here i just fill in there so that's a four by four so that's x y z for um for all the four legs, which means there's mm -hmm. a, a row of uh, Ws that's not used mm. because uh, there's four legs and all of them uses three, so only 12 values. So the Ws, I don't remember if I do some metadata thing with them, but uh, they are basically unused and doesn't matter. But there's no support for float four by three in the system, so I can't use four by three. Oh, uh, uh, so, so yeah, just... that was going to be my question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't remember. Maybe maybe there's a way around it, but I, I think it's more of a limitation in shader graph than anything. Mm. Maybe if I wrote it by oh, hand, okay. I could okay. get that access to it. Yeah. Uh, so if we now go into the this thing, um, crawler. Uh, now let's see if I can get this stuff to actually find my stuff let's open the crawler skin emissive and we can take a look the, the the trickiest part about this is really to ray cost and because when you ray cost you get the the world position of the of the ray cost right mm -hmm. of the of the hit but when you're rendering when you're rendering the crawler then you're in 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 then you're going to render it relative to the local to, to the world position of the crawler. So the, the offset from the crawler is the relevant part, not the world position. So you need to recalculate that to make sure that in the array is the is the um, local the position local of the bit, foot yeah. relative okay. to the crawler's world position. Hmm. Um, but other uh, <laughs> oh, this is a fascinating resolution. <laughs> uh, let's see if we can find anything going on here. That is uh, quite the uh, complex graph you got going there. Uh, this is nothing compared actually, to the pa parallax stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. The, the parallax interior, that is, is a weirdly big one. I anyway, link to that, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so here we have the leg position. And uh, this is where the magic happens. So this reference is the same name as um uh this the same name as uh, what i wrote in the, the material override and uh, then you see here we get a full four by four size and the only thing that really needs to be done here to make sure it works is to press this override property declaration and then specify hybrid per instance that means that this graph will hook properly into the dot system and pick up that that component array and and pull that over to the gpu so all the entities you're rendering have the the respective component value available um so yeah so and and uh, then then i then there's one one way to pick this this four by four matrix out so this is how it done just and then I just use that, um, and here it's super annoying. So this is this is super weird. So this is just one graph render, uh, one one execution. This is on the vertex, right? Vertex shader. Mm -hmm. So we're doing one vertex at a time, like any other vertex shader. So how do I know which foot when I'm supposed to read what what position? Because the specific point on the the specific foot vertex needs to be uh, needs to be identified and then read that uh, that position in the buffer and put that point on that spot right okay so i i have the the four different uh, legs have each a unique vertex color and that's a vertex color that's baked into the uh, vfx uh, to the uh, like into the mesh basically or yeah 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 i 
F, 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 FBX, FBX, that's FBX. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's b- baked into the FBX. Oh, and cool. And then I, I, yeah, and then I split it up and I do some some uh, some sort of math on it to make the 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 value the, the color value into a easy digestible value, and then I have this comparison. So if the vertex color value is equal to one, then I should read the first position in the, the the first row in the matrix if it's equal to two then i read the second and i just so and and all of the rest doesn't it's read a smart any solution of the yeah yeah you so just yeah basically um, sample the vertex for what its color is and then yeah yeah do some basically logic to see yeah determine you know if it is a foot and yeah if it's not then i guess you just don't do anything different yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but then yeah if I, it is then you can yeah set the position yeah, yeah. So cool. that did you come up with that I, yourself, or did you did you find that trick somewhere else? No, I I, I came up with that myself. I like it. <laughs> yeah, that was. But it's gone to a through. This is not like oh, I got an idea and then I program. This is like a year of it. <laughs> Banging yeah. your head against the wall, like. But, well, oh, well. Man. To be fair, like I, I implemented this in the built-in renderer uh, through just normal. Oh, okay. Uh, code in the beginning. Because back I, when it was hybrid renderer v1 back when this game wasn't even um uh, hgrp oh, okay yeah yeah, yeah. So it was uh, just completely just built in and just straightforward and uh, like that uh, and uh, then it gone through a few iterations it was once uh, something called a structural buffer where i send over the buffer explicitly through my own call and then i sample that through code uh but then i realized uh, that that's basically the same thing that's going on right now uh so i could just swap it out and and use a float by four by four to capture the, the thing was that in the beginning the crawlers was supposed to have a, an, a, a variable amount of legs mm. so that makes it a little bit trickier so the, the original code supported a variable amount of it legs. could be like a spider with eight legs or something yeah exactly so that's how all of the enemies in just read instructions is uh, animated. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> they, all of them are animated by just uh, on the vertex shader, moving the vertexes. That's cool. Uh, there's no bones or anything. Everything is just uh, completely math based. Uh, uh, you know, this is how like bones are made through similar ways. It's just a bunch of math with some vertex color data that says like, oh, this arm is part of this bone. And right, this, right, know, yeah, goes through makes a sense. Bit of a yeah, just basically finding ways to stuff in metadata to your existing data structures. Exactly. So it's it's fascinating, and then and then and then when you realize that, and and you if you have time and 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 are a little bit weird like I am, you're like, ah, oh, I can make this myself in a different way, and not have to rely on this generic bone structure. Bone the bone structure, the one that like Blender spits out, that has a bunch of weird limitation and quirks that you need to deal with when you do mm. it. So so, um, yeah, uh, I I just. I just, I have a Pac-Man animation where it's like a 3D Pac-Man that moves his mouth. That's completely math-based also. That's Sweet. like, yeah, it's just, just a GPU animated. And you can do so much with Shady Graph if you just go nuts with it. That's super cool. That's super cool. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's that. Uh, should we jump into the level generation quickly? Yeah. That sounds great to me. Yeah uh that like all other things i'm not really sure on which end to start uh actually real quick we can hit this question uh the player characters are animated with bones though right yeah yeah the the yes um so i can show that real quick here uh cara uh, that was right character animator No, that was a little bit wrong. Let's see here if we can find our way back to the actual right thing here. My my computer is so slow right now. <laughs> it's just barely shipping for air doing all of this stuff at the same time. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, there we have the start. So death animation updates. So here we have a normal entity iteration. 
Um, and you can see here is a bunch of first person camera, health, gameplay state. This is the old rival thing before it got integrated into Unity. So this is a character controller component. That's um, Philips is the name, right? Uh, his his old stuff. Uh, yeah, I yeah. haven't upgraded because yeah. Uh, and then we have pla player character, which just basically holds the reference to the animator and all everything that needs to be. And then I just so for example, if we go here playing, then we just like pick up character body, relative velocity, local velocity. We send it into this um, update loop here. Where we have you know all of this typical thing is grounded your local velocity all of those things which affects how the player character is animated and then we just you know <laughs> push a bunch of them into the into the mechanism controller and hopefully it animates <laughs> properly <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 just ripped from Mixamo and just basic animated and the arms are are uh, different layers they are completely ik so they're oh, cool. called the, okay. the are that thing yeah but, but the the feet are just straight up in simple Mixamo with some blending and some fancy and stuff not not really fancy but yeah so that's how the characters are anim animated uh because that's just uh, that's not really a relevant thing to do in dots yet there's no good reason for it uh, this is not a performance issue at all hope that answers the question so let's uh, go into this um so this is a this is a fascinating thing so i made my old gener generation tool uh if it wants to load here Oh, wow. I don't know how this will show on stream. So we, we this is get the idea if you yeah, talk us through what's going on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is based on something called Xnode, which is an open source uh, node based tool. Um, and uh, this is just different steps. Uh, so the way it works is that this runner here, just like make sure to run all of these nodes in order. And if we take a look at an, an, uh, a node here, we can like, um, let's see here, we can find something that's fairly easy. Uh, oh, give me a second. This is sub sub um, sub graphs. So if I go into this, there's another graph inside of here. <laughs> So I have subgraphs, uh, so I can just nest it how much I want and reuse uh, subgraphs. Um, but if we take a look here, like, uh, uh, you know what? That one isn't the best example. It's better to use uh, houses. House part decoration, advanced flower pots. So in this one, we can look at the code. So this is a uh, in the in the bottom of it all. It's a scriptable render object. Okay. So the normal Unity stuff, and and it's uh, then and and then that's what the X node is built on, uh, right? So every X node is a scriptable render object. Okay. Um, and then you have this, and then all of that on top of that, all of that stuff is mine. So this execute is. A function that gets called when when the runner executes your node, and it's an I enumerator because I can return yield yield return null. I don't know if you know what yield return is. Yep. Yeah. yeah of course. Yeah. So, uh, so you'll that return null that that'll I... bring you back there to the next frame, right? Yeah, well, it will, it will, uh, I can continue, this makes it so I can step through this. So, so whenever I do yield return, I can do a step and then I can continue with one click next. So I can put how many yield returns in I want and then step through the function mm. step by step. So, so I can like view what's happening in each step, even though okay. it's, uh, it's, it's one node, I can subdivide it for the debug debugging purposes, nothing else, just gotcha, debugging purposes. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay. 
Uh, but here then, I and this is maybe a little bit complex to go into, so I won't. But I, I basically have like uh, a, a type here, and if we look here, this is this is this one prefab here. So we have a plow mm -hmm. pot, and it got an ID. This is a specific thing I built, so it can identify the flower pot uh, in the dots world without needing the actual game object prefab. Just having the an uh, go ID which identify it. So I, I identify it, and then this is prefabs. So, so what this basically does is like it's, it's um, putting, uh, it's decorating different parts of a house. So um, uh, it just executes some code here, which instances a bunch of entities based on different rules, based on, and it, it's, I use uh, jobs. So I can do it in, uh, I can't really do it like in parallel, but I can do a bunch of them in parallel like that. I can't, I can't continue with anything, but I can at least go wide when I just do one thing. Um, but so, so it just executes this, this thing. And by this point, I already have an, uh, a world set up with all of the different things in the world. So I just, then I can query against the world and like find, oh, I can find the, the entities that is a part of the of the of the of the house and oh it's on this position then i can place another stuff on that position right beside it uh so so i basically i i generate a foundation and then i put in stuff and for every node i just qu query for the stuff i put in and find stuff that i want to add on to and i add on to that uh so i, I can i can show it a little bit more in practice by just doing a few steps here um so th this is this is the whole all of the, um, the 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 nodes in the order they were run in so this is generated by the system when i like connect a new node it turns out oh this node will be gen will be run in this order in this place and i can run them manually if i want to uh let's see here if i can find where i'm at in this uh yeah, that should be fine so if i start with the basic city blocks this is actually game objects first um uh which uh, just generates a city block mesh with the pro builder so it's yeah, doing yeah, yeah. pro builder generation in the background uh this uh usually takes a little bit of time the first time that's, i do it that, that's one thing that i've kind of used for uh different like building systems or generation systems it's like typically easier to like deal with all the asset management and stuff with game objects um, and then, you know, when it's ready to rock, then that can be converted over to entities if needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, well, uh, I think uh, the darkness is really screwing with it. I'm, I'm just, uh, I haven't recompiled these shaders. Uh, but you can see, <laughs> this is, this is road. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't, oh, oh okay. man, come on. I can barely, I can barely see it. an outline, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Why is it recompiling this? It's not like I haven't developed on this laptop before. I made a large part of the game on this laptop. Um, but now you can see also, like you can see, there's a there's a trash bin beside this. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like tagged all the entities and the uh, mono ba um, game of base created with a specific tag associated with that node. So I can just. To, uh, decide to remove just the result from that node if I want to. If I don't do it in order, it will break. But I can like reverse it in order also if I want to, uh, which means that I can like re uh, generate something, remove it, change something, generate and back and forth, back and forth. And, like try what what uh, value fits the best. Uh, let's see if I if we got more. <laughs> All right, well I'll just move on through the next. <laughs> part of this uh, of this uh, generation and we'll see if we can get because without lighting you will see everything perfectly fine so it's just my gpu that is just or i don't know is it compiling on the cpu or gpu i don't know actually i i, I would have no idea <laughs> uh here we have you can see now there's something else here so this is the sidewalk super dark we will get a little bit of a um, I can actually go through with all of this until we get some lights on the map. That's probably a good idea. Uh, 
Can I? Bah, 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 bah. Where are we? Here we are. Ah, it, it broke. I, I, I have to just redo it quickly. So now you're just kind of adding in some of the different building blocks. You say, I want this level to have some basic city blocks and road markings, or is that is that basically what you're doing? Yeah, you're kind of exactly, like defining exactly. what things are available in a in a world. Or yeah, level, yeah, I guess. exactly, exactly. And and all of them is are seeded by uh, one seed. So that means that it so it, it can be, obviously be deterministic. It, it needs to be completely deterministic because this is multiplayer and I just sync the seed. I've actually had that issue. So a uh, 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 fun fact, oh no, maybe I can see it. Yes, we can see it a little bit. So now you see the structure. Oh no, actually it's, the, the, the contrast is like 10 times better on my computer. You know what? <laughs> Let, let's let's just quickly try with the other map here, which is different type of lighting on and see if that works better. Um, oh, yeah, never mind. I, I, I didn't swap. It didn't swap uh, my uh, map properly. Let's see here. It's are actually kind of all, cool. Are these kind of all custom tools that you built or is this Part of like the some of like the Xnode stuff, or where is this kind of all coming from? No, everything is completely made from scratch, custom by me, except awesome. for Xnode. Yeah, awesome. I'm that's yeah, it's crazy. It's like I I want to be proud of it, but it's also pretty pretty crazy to build all this custom. <laughs> well, I mean, like yeah, this. you're you're the only developer. You're the only person who needs to know how to use it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, but as long as it works for you, would be a lot better to not be that custom about it to make it a little bit simpler maybe not have this grand idea of having all and have this tool to make it so explicit uh, it helps a lot to have the nice node tool uh do we uh, we got a thing i did yeah uh, you can put up on the screen if you want to yeah yeah, yeah. just answer that quickly yeah uh, did you ever run into floating point precision on different machine no um it doesn't really depend on that it's it doesn't really read it's not like there's very few like discrete things that would flip over if I'm slightly over some floating point thing. Um, so, but there could be a problem. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that would be a problem. I've never had that problem so far. So far, but uh, like I said, it's like it's very rarely using some float value to determine on or off or something like that. And that would be the case uh, that would trigger this problem more more severely uh so now we can see a little bit actually so i can i can show uh so we got uh, the basic city blocks and then we got city street streets and sidewalks um we'll see here this usually mm -hmm. just goes like this on my computer oh. well not necessarily now you can see a little bit better here also okay uh, yeah so you see there's a this is actually like a spline tool that generates this mesh on the fly. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, and you can see they are not, not uniform. Uh, yeah, you can have some. Yeah, I can have them way more squiggly if I want to, but this map is like, a, it's it's supposed to be uniform. Kind of more city, uh, yeah. And then I can do that, and then we have road markings. Then we have sidewalk tiles. So now we have this inner tile set here. We could actually mm -hmm. do like, this let me let me do um, uh, just disable the fog and we can see a lot better that oh you metric fog yeah and then we can go um, bam we have houses yeah and, and my, my computer just like <laughs> all the time. so we have houses and these guys have my my shader so oh, there's yeah, nothing yeah, inside yeah. here. Yep. But uh, there's uh, something. Yeah. So that's the fake interior shader that you link to. Um, yeah. And uh, Xnode link that I saw you find it. Yeah. Uh, and then driveway. So and now now we have like uh, so so for example the driveway here uh, that needs to connect this uh, garage to the side, right? Mm -hmm. So the way this works is that inside of this prefab, I have a defined, this is entities, by the way. Everything you look at by this point is entities. Okay, cool. 
yeah so so i have like this this edge right here i think has a defined like uh garage opening right side it's like a single entity that has that tag sort of right <laughs> and when i press driveway it just it just queries for um house part with tag garage opening and then it from that position it generates stuff And now I have this one. Cool. And is that like going over top of the sidewalk or is that kind of cutting out of the sidewalk? That's going on on top. I'll just run over it with a little bit okay. of a buffer. So it's it's yeah, just I was, I was curious not, not it making like it better. cutting out or something or yeah. but it's it's very specifically designed to be over that one, but under that right. one. Right. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah, and then you have this thing where it's like this is how it looks underneath. So you have this side, this thing, but then just a big block underneath to make sure it just uh, just covers. Uh, and all of them are, you know, different sizes and stuff. Not none of all of them are unique. So because they are different lengths and stuff. And then after that, we can go with the prefab block frame. Uh, I thought. That should have happened now. Let me let me let me do like this quickly, and run this. This shouldn't be that. Um, so I can run the different sub uh, subgraphs one by one. So I can like decide to oh this whole subgraph which generates just a flat ground. I can run them them all together with one quick click. Mm. So I can no. Uh, when I work on it, I can easily, you know, skip through different parts and do exactly what I want. Um, and hopefully this will, God damn it. <laughs> I should have been home with my, with my proper big computer for this. Yeah. I didn't realize how this would, how long this would take on my laptop. Uh, and now we can probably press this one again and we can get the whole thing going. So you can see all of it. Um, there we go. Yeah. So here we have. So now we put on. So so this one, you know, was generated via a small, small entity here. Okay. And then we have like the. There's also like the op door op uh, the 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 house door, mm -hmm. just the normal door, and it uh, and this one is 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 placed by that, just like a random offset from the door. And then this frame right here is generated from from just the the sidewalk edge, so it just moves in, and then it, and, uh, enough for it to not intersect with the with the the these plates. But you see, I am still you know have problems with it. But this yeah, is just, just some I, little I, yeah, artifact in here and there. Yeah, and then we can go forward and we can do this one, and now we have. And this one uses just like a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, qu queries for all sidewalk sides, and just like ah, well, if we just spawn things like four or five decimeters in, we'll have a tree here. And uh, a lot of these guys, and uh, these guys, and all sorts of things. Um, Props and everything, yeah. Yeah. So from just a flat thing to this pretty well uh like now it looks yeah, like I mean, a suburban it, it, neighborhood it, i was just gonna say it looks exactly like a suburban neighborhood and that was all basically generated on the fly yeah and this takes four seconds on a good computer when you nice. run it. yeah <laughs> that's and, awesome and and like three of those seconds is just pro builder messing around so ECS <laughs> is like the quickest thing ever in this context. What are the, yeah, the, the uh, I was just going to ask, what are the like sizes of your maps? Like what are your, some of your smaller ones and bigger ones? Uh, I think this one is 600 times 600, maybe five. Let's see. We can check it, check it so out. Like a little, a little over half a kilometer in each direction. Yeah. Something like that. Let's see here if we have a, uh, no, 400 times 400. 
was okay. this one. So a little bit under. Is that one uh, of your it's just, bigger ones or is that like a pretty average size map? That's pretty average size. Yeah. I think I have one bigger and all, but most of, well, well um, one of them is completely different. It's out in space. Uh, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't have it's uh, just platforms out in space. right yeah 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 so it doesn't have this thing but other one I think are four hundred and four hundred or five hundred times five hundred and the fun part is that like we we could we could uh, we could uh, go like this if we zoom out a bit here so we have this now we can see all of it and we just clear it and then we can. See how much everything breaks if we do like this. <laughs> it, it honestly, it won't look perf uh, anywhere near as it should be, but it will probably work. And I, I just press the root button, root generation, and it will probably take like maybe a minute or something. But yeah, the, so the, that, the that root issue... button that kind of automatically puts in all the sub things, the basic city blocks, streets and sidewalks, collision. Yeah, you can markings. see the indentation. The, in, the indentation yeah. sort of shows exactly what we're doing with it. Okay. And and all of that, I built all of that. So that's just custom. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the actual hardest part about this is finding ways to efficiently make big, big randomized structures that doesn't feel too random. Hmm like like oh yeah so so we got the 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 difference now is that we got a huge shot and <laughs> lawn on all of them yeah but that's that's how robust the, the system is so it's just so like it's a suburb out. out in the middle of texas or something where everyone's living on two and a half acres yeah and we can we can even do it we can do like that we can see what happens if we go back to this one and go to the ground generation uh, oh, street width. We we maybe do top twelve. So for proper for for big trucks, for big Texas uh, pickup <laughs> trucks, big Dodge Ram three fifty or what is it? What is it? Something like that. Big big. Oh yeah. Uh, I I don't know if it's gonna work. Uh, I, I I haven't messed with these values for a long time. Um, but it's kind of fun when you have this system where you can. Uh, and and the, the node node uh, structure in this case is very very nice because you can add on decoration with just another node. You know, oh, I want some I want some bicycles. Then you have like, okay, we had this node which generates along side sidewalks, just an offset negative uh, or positive. Okay, so yeah, that's basically the same thing, just a wider road. Sweet. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Um. So just like, oh, uh, this node generates stuff along the lines of every sidewalk. So if you have a positive value, it goes into the road. A negative value, it goes into the sidewalk. And then you have some randomized um, spacing and some randomized rotation. And you just put in how many of those nodes you want and just execute with all of the different and uh, prefabs that you want to just scatter around the world. And that's how all of the maps are built basically yeah um yeah that's uh, that's that's the level generation it's it's very hard to make it very interesting i don't think this map is super interesting but the, the thing you do on it is pretty interesting uh, and it's supposed to be a little bit weird you know it's just the same house over and over uh <laughs> it's because uh, help john move you move um john lives in all of the houses one john everybody's named named john here it's a it's very a good, strange it's a good strong name yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes maybe i should name them all johnny instead <laughs> help johnny move <laughs> yeah um yeah that's um what's the time all right we're we're over the two hour mark i guess we can uh, maybe like call that uh, yeah well and for yeah i mean if, yeah if anybody has any if anybody has any questions about any of the stuff that we talked about or uh, just have any questions on Tobias's game in general. Um, yeah. Fire yeah, away. Yeah, feel free to uh, go ahead and drop those in. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely so excited for uh, playing this game here. So hopefully it gets released soon rather yeah, than later. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I, I'm I'm thinking. Uh, let me check the the show notes and see if there's anything that I should. That's quick to 
bring up uh, uh, let me let me do it like this so I don't go crazy with Dox yourself. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, hey, blah, 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 blah. So here's a probably a simple question you can answer in the background. Uh, does the game ever display a scoreboard anywhere where you can compare your performance with the people you're playing with? Yeah, yeah. In the end, it says exactly how many how many you. Shot, how many uh, how many crawlers you shot, how many specials you shot, how many people you revived, how many times you died, how many times you get revived, how many times you escaped from limbo, and how many times you threw away a weapon, I think. I don't remember. I got even more stats, but they are all a little <laughs> bit too esic. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's like you know, you as the developer, you can keep track of everything under the sun, and that's super cool, but it's like, you know, you don't yeah. necessarily need to display that all to your player like every yeah. time like the game ends they're scrolling through like five pages of stats and it all just kind of blurs over yes. yeah you just yeah hit the hit the most important things yeah 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 um but uh um uh, i i had a bunch of them but then i i played i played with a few friends this was maybe a year ago and we played a few games and then afterwards like all of them most of them were like zero like because it didn't happen that much. Because it's just like, like oh, yeah, some yeah. random thing and it that doesn't like, happen very often. It wasn't like a bad design by me. It was just that this doesn't happen very often, and it's fine. And right, like, well, right. I shouldn't even have that. I, I still like kept the tracking, but I just like disabled the the UI for it. So yeah, um, uh, I could one Important thing that I can just oh Important yeah update here. from Steam. Yeah, I've actually had an unread email while we were talking, and I was to. Give it, so, give it a look. Give it a look. Should, 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 we, should we have it live? <laughs> don't, you don't need to <laughs> show yeah, your email here. All it's right. Fine. It's fine. That's all, yeah, all right. Uh, how does it? Where? Which one? This is this the one? This is the new one. View message. Build review application. We encountered issues. Oh, Visual no. Failure. Your app appears to include online th in, and, and in-game chat, but it has, hasn't been disclosed in your convey under please select any category to apply. Okay. Your app appears to include online act interactivity and in-game chat, but it hasn't been disclosed <laughs> in your content survey. Oh, wow. That's a... Uh, that's, uh, insane the uh what um uh, what's it called uh, weird thing to well never mind i, I can't yeah that, the word. that's just yeah that's typical with platforms is there's just like yes yeah, some very an, again an, like we were saying issue. very specific yeah regulations that yeah yeah everything needs to oh well uh, maybe i can just fix this after the stream and send it in again and maybe they can Accepted yeah, and, and hopefully, yeah, that it kind of did the initial review process that, um, you know, as long as you just check the appropriate boxes, then it should hopefully go through faster. Yeah, maybe I don't need to even change the app. So that's, uh, that's probably pretty all right. Um, well, we'll, we'll uh, wrap this up soon. So you can do that. So maybe at least get it in by the end of the, the work day oh, today. Oh, here was a problem. Yes, we received an infinite loading screen. When I'm yeah, 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 I had actually that issue, and I fixed it. Uh, I, I, I just didn't remember if it was uh, something that I sent in with the witch build. Uh, okay. uh, so I, I, well, it, wasn't, it, it was just not loading anything. It wasn't an inf uh, like an infinite loop. It was just not loading the, the, the level gotcha. at all. It gotcha. just screwed up. Maybe that's why um, it took so long. They were like literally just sitting in front of their computer for five days waiting for it to load and it never <laughs> yeah, yeah. never loaded it in. But but now I'm slightly annoyed that uh, this this could they probably have sent this to me like four days ago and I could have fixed everything and been on because they yeah. they, they wrote to me like, Oh, we just forgot to send it to you. Thank you for reminding us. Uh, yeah, so That's all of this, over. this is just for me to send in the new build that has already up and then just probably select something in the sort, as you said, uh, or cool. in the, in well, the uh, content survey. Yeah, yeah. hopefully your uh, all right. gets approved at least early in the FPS Fest. How long is the FPS Fest going for? A week, I think, most, uh, 
most uh, things are that a week. Okay. That most tests sense. are a week. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. All Damn. righty. Well, um, I guess with that, we can go ahead and start closing some things out um, and just do our dynamic allocations with sort of the fun things to share with the community. Um, I can go ahead and pull up the what you had for yours here. So yeah, I was actually, uh, <laughs> I had was watching this video earlier, but uh, why don't you go ahead and, and let the people know what this is all about. Oh yeah, uh, so uh, this is a very fascinating optimization uh, thing that uh, comes from, uh, from uh, original Quake. And honestly, this guy, Simon Dev, I have no idea who he is or whatever, <laughs> a very underrated uh, YouTuber. Uh, yeah, he's awesome. All of yeah. his... Oh, you have already seen the, him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe everybody's seen this already. But uh, to me, it was uh, somebody I didn't hear much about until I stumbled on, on him myself. Anyway, they just talk about a very fascinating old school optimization that John Carmack did back in the day. Uh, John Carmack and Michael Abrash uh, did this together. And uh, I thought it was very fascinating. A binary space tree. I never, I never heard about that before, but now I know about it, and I feel like I want to do something where it's used. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was interesting. I was, I was watching part of the video, and if I remember correctly, I think he was basically saying that it's not like super relevant anymore, but it's still like kind of good yeah. knowledge to um, help you understand just kind of how computers process graphics um, and how they yeah. kind of tackled some of these um, problems back in the day when they had. You know, very limiting computing resources and not even any dedicated GPUs yet. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's just a fascinating uh, optimization uh, explanation, which I find, found interesting. Yeah. So go ahead and uh, check that video out. It's definitely worth the watch, I'd say. Um, and then what I wanted to share is a game that uh, is out right now. Uh, which is Final Factory. So this is um, a game made with Unity's dots and ECS. As you can see, it's kind of this uh, you know factory automation type game, um, but there is kind of some combat elements in there as well. So you kind of you know build out this crazy massive factory, um, and yeah, I mean this is again all built with uh, dots and ECS. So it's always cool to you know highlight some of the new uh, ECS games that have been created. Um, so yeah, this one is available on Steam right now. It's called Final Factory, and I wonder if they'll do the uh, Final Fantasy thing, where you know it's supposed to be the Final Fantasy, but then they go ahead and make you know 17 Final Fantasy games. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, you can get it now. Um, it is a early access game, but I'm still basically uh, I think released uh, yeah just just earlier this week. So yeah, go ahead and check it out. Seems like a fun one. I haven't played it myself, but um, yeah, again, always want to highlight the uh, new interesting dots and ECS games there. So yeah, um, that is uh, basically what we have for the show. So we can go ahead and kind of close things out here. Um, do just want to quickly thank all of our Patreon supporters. Um, it does really help us because, again, we're a small operation over here, so any amount of support that you can give uh, really does go a long way, so we really do appreciate it. And do just want to call out our top-tier Patreon supporters at the CPU Register tier. So thank you very much to Equal for your support. Um, again, really does go a long way. So anyways, with that, that is um, basically it for this episode of The Hot Path Show. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Tobias, for giving us an insight into your project. Um, unfortunately, obviously, we don't have the source code up available for this one for obvious <laughs> reasons. <laughs> well, but um, Maybe yeah, one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, hopefully that all gave you all a, a good insight about... Um, you know, how he was kind of tackling some of the problems in his game. And again, you know, we don't necessarily aren't saying like, you know, these are the way that you should be approaching every problem, but um, it just kind of goes to show you that, you know, when you do run into some problems like this, again, you know, look at the data, uh, look at what your profiler tells you, and then, you know, how do you kind of like solve that um, in, in the most efficient way possible? All right, any uh, closing words for us here? 
Uh, no. Uh, go and buy my game and then when it comes out. <laughs> yeah, go and, yeah, at least, at least wish list, just read the instructions. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully it'll be out imminently here. <laughs> yes, Monday, I think probably Monday. That sounds I, I sure hope I, so, I think yeah. they feel bad about me not getting through the review process faster, so I will send back, like, please review it fast. I, I want it to be out on Monday. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right. But otherwise, great, great, great. Cool. Talk. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining us here today. Really appreciate all the uh, questions and activity in the chat here and everything. So uh, yeah, with that, hopefully uh, you all have a great weekend ahead. If there's any uh, UFC fans out there, there's a very big uh, UFC card this weekend for UFC 300. So um, go enjoy that. <laughs> uh, anyways, with that, um, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Bye.